Well, Justin, we're back. Uh, another exciting episode here. At least the markets are pretty exciting yeah. right now. We're seeing a lot of volatility going on. Uh, definitely getting some questions, and which is extremely natural. If you uh, if you don't have a reaction to what's going on right now, either you're a really high quality qualified advisor or you've got ice in your veins. So <laughs> we thought we would. Uh, do a little series here and, and really take the opportunity to kick off uh, more as a way to reassure clients. So hopefully our clients are listening to this. And then also just to frame for our audience, um, you know, times like these, they're unnerving, but what is the best way to go about investments, investing your portfolio, the hard earned money that you've earned? Um, how do you actually put that to work in a, in a really smart way? I mean, it's, it's testing, right? You're going to see markets go up and down. And in times where they go down, you you naturally should question, am I doing the right things? And so, you know, we thought it'd be good to revisit some of the basics. Uh, and we're going to kick that off today. We're going to talk uh, most importantly, or I guess where we're going to start is with market pricing. Uh, it sounds like a, a fancy term, but really, what assumptions are we basing, you know, our decision making upon? And can we trust those assumptions? I think, you know, a lot of times, especially the financial media is going to throw a lot of things out there and, and make us question it. But, you know, I thought it would be really good, Justin, maybe for you to just start there. And let's talk a little bit about how prices are even established in markets. Do, how do we know if they're right or maybe they're not? Maybe they're wrong and there is some way to game the market. But uh, maybe start there, talk a little bit about markets and how they price it and what kind of information we can glean from it. This is a it's a real meaty topic um, and we'll try and keep it as entertaining and engaging as possible because it, it can be very academic, can be a little bit uh, uh, nerdy or geeky, if you will. But it's really, really important at the same time. And what we're talking about a lot here is public market prices as well. We'll try and do our best to to frame or qualify whether or not we're talking public market, private market. But uh, for the most part, we're going to be talking about uh, public market um, prices here because that's really what is front and center. When when you turn on the news or go to your go, go online and look at whatever news source it is, you'll see you know the the S and P five hundred experienced another day of volatility, another down day, another up day, whatever it may be. To your point, there has been a lot of volatility, both up up and down, and and. You know, that's one of the benefits of the public markets, how how liquid they are and accessible they are. But in times like this, it's also a, a real uh, detriment or a negative aspect of it because it is so front and center. It really does get your emotions going. Um, and it's only like like you said, it's only natural to kind of ask questions or pause and think. And so we're going to, like you said, go through this this series and talk about the fundamental beliefs that we have about around pursuing a better or implementing a better uh, investment experience. A lot of it does start with, with the fundamental aspect of markets, how markets work. What do you need to establish pricing, market pricing? And quite simply, you need a buyer and a seller. Mm -hmm. And, you know, think about the real estate market. That's a very, very simple way or going to, uh, even to the, the grocery store. That's a market. There's a buyer and a seller there that, that come together to, to make a, a transaction. Stock market is really no different. Uh, there's a lot more volume, however, uh, within the stock market than there is at the grocery store or even within the real estate market. For, for every one real estate property, maybe there's five, 10 buyers or uh, p potential buyers. Obviously, only one actually gets there. Within the, um, within the public stock market, there are millions of transactions and buyers and sellers that come together on a daily basis. And really at the end of the day, that is what leads to what we've talked about time, time and time again, a much more efficient market. Is it perfectly efficient? You know, for anyone who's really, uh, uh, steeped in, in, in this topic, right? We're, we're, we're going to keep it high level and we don't want to get too into the weeds, but is it perfectly efficient? No, by no means, but it, it, it is a really highly competitive, efficient marketplace where buyers and sellers are coming together to exchange uh, exchange stocks for or bonds for for actual cash, and they're doing so based on real time information. And there's substantial amount of information that comes into every single one of these trades that happen on a daily basis. Yeah, no, and I think that's a great point. And and by a lot of trades, right, seven hundred and seventy five billion dollars worth of trades last year. So, and what happens, like you said, when you have a buyer and a seller? 
and there's a trade is it gives us all a lot more information about what's actually going on. So while all of what we've been experiencing lately may be unnerving, it's actually a sign of a really healthy market. I mean, we've had some pretty negative events happen in the world. Um, we've had wars going on, inflation numbers are ticking up, there's interest rates are, are you know going up to say the least. And so what's happening is the market, right? The, the market participants are de- taking this information in and reestablishing a price for, let's say, for a security based on the new information that's being provided. And when we see markets move like this and react to information, it's actually a good thing, right? It starts to validate. Most definitely. And so I think that's the other thing. And you hit on this is that the ne- next natural question should be then, Efficient markets, I think a lot of people get confused on this, but does that mean that the price for everything is correct? And, and the short answer is no. Um, you know, that's that's pretty impossible. But what it is saying is that, you know, or at least what you're having to to believe or what you should believe it, that it is the best estimate of what the value actually is. Because if we unpack that a little bit, if you believe that that's not the best es- estimate, then you have to believe the other side of it that, you know, their, their market is actually wrong and that the price is not what the collective wisdom uh, is saying that it is. So you're taking the stance that your beliefs, your thought on what a stock or the stock market, et cetera, uh, is actually being priced is more educated or better than the collective $775 billion worth of trades that went through. Am I am I spot on there? No, you're spot on. Another way to even frame that, uh, and, and actually a, per, uh, a portfolio manager early in my career made this statement, uh, and he was actually with an actively managed uh, firm, no less, um, oversaw billions upon billions of dollars. He basically said, you know, you think about it like this, you, let's take Apple as a perfect example. Everyone knows that company. There are probably a hundred analysts that cover that stock. And each one of those analysts spend essentially every minute of their waking day of their professional life trying to come up with what the accurate price of, of Apple should be. Well, first of all, they actually don't do a very good job of that. The, the numbers show you. We can get into that. That's a whole nother podcast. But then just take a step back even from that data. It, divorce yourself from that for a second. Ask yourself the question, These people are spending every waking minute on one single company. Why do we feel like we have any sort of additional insight in in what Apple should be worth uh, versus those individuals? Again, still within those individuals, they don't do a very good job and they're spending every minute of their waking day. Why do we have any additional insight into that and what Apple should be worth? And the short answer is you you don't. It, the numbers show that. You could get lucky, but there's no skill in that. There's a big difference between skill versus luck in that equation and something to keep in mind. Oh, I think it's a great point. And I, I think going back, right, the reason why this is so hard to do is because, you know, in the public markets, information's regulated. Yep. If you have information other people don't have, sure, you you have a competitive advantage. Don't trade on it because you'll likely end up in jail <laughs> and they have pretty good ways of finding people like that. But at the end of the day, if you have the same amount of information, then you're probably going to arrive at a pretty good number. And it, as a collective, we are horrible, this human nature species, right? At horrible at estimating things on our own. We all know that if you, you know, count how many calories, there's all kinds of studies, <laughs> right? You're in a diet, count the number of calories. I mean, you're missing by 30%. Right. Um, you know, but if you take maybe like, I don't know, a hundred people, you start to, you probably start to get a lot closer. I think there's a great example. There was an advisor uh, that's been quoted time and time again that tells a story of about setting a a jar full of jelly beans on the table at a client event and put out a contest. So we want you to guess how many jelly beans are in the jar. We've probably all played this game when we were kids at some point, right? Um, But it was pretty fascinating what ended up coming out of that jelly bean example. Everybody had access to the same information. Everybody could see the jar. Everybody could pick it up. Everybody could turn it over and hold it and all that type of stuff. You know, if you had been the one putting the beans in the jar, competitive advantage, but everybody else, (laughs) right? You got to look at this jar and there was an incredible range of guesses. Somebody guessed 400 on the low end, 409, somebody on the high end, 
5,365. And we're talking, you know, 100 people guessing on this jar at least. The average guess was 1,653. The actual number of jelly beans in the jar was 1,670. We are just better together, right? right? And I, let me just jump in too. And, uh, you know, this, you can call this the wisdom of the crowds. And even I want to uh, go back to your point about the price being always right or not. Um, doesn't really apply to that jelly bean example perfectly. But the, the other way to think about this, and you alluded to it, is that these are models, right? The, and this is the best model that is out there mm -hmm. to explain reality. I think that's a really important piece to keep in mind. Is it perfect? No, but it's a lot better than the other models in terms of explanatory powers of what happens on a day-to-day -day or annual, week-to-week, -week, annual, uh, year-over-year, whatever you want to call it, um, movement within the markets. It explains the most and it gives you a higher confidence in your outcomes and, uh, and leads you, we, we mentioned, to a better overall investment experience over the long term. I think that's a really, really important point to hit on. No, I think it's a, a fantastic point. And so we're going to wrap things up today, but the key takeaway we really want you to, to take away from today's episode and we're going to hit on this theme also to end the rest of these episodes is really starting to control what you actually can control you can't control you know some crazy hypothesis on whether you know the market's up and down or or a company should be worth something else really take yourself back to the evidence right control what you can control control the fact that the market provides a lot of information and is going to give you the best possible price uh, that that we all could probably figure out. So use that information and start that as the, the starting building block for pr pursuing this better investment experience. And in doing so, you're going to you know build your financial structure better. We're going to get into how you control taxes, all those types of things. But this is really a foundational building block we, we want you to, to focus on. Uh, next week, we're going to kind of continue this series. The next building block, block we're going to jump into is resisting chasing past performance. This is another fantastic one. And I'm sure going to blow a lot of people minds that unfortunately the winners don't keep winning uh, here in in the public markets like they do in, in the private markets just to continue to draw that distinction. Um, but before uh, we close out again, reminding everybody we'd love to, to get a text from you. Uh, hopefully this episode was helpful. We'd love clarifying questions or even questions about you know chasing past performance that we'll hit on next week. That number to shoot me a text is 602-704- Five five seven four uh, would be happy to to respond to you directly and then also address it on the podcast. And until next time, own your wealth, make an impact, and always be a pro. The information in this podcast is educational and general in nature, and does not take into consideration the listener's personal circumstances. Therefore, it is not intended to be a substitute for specific, individualized financial, legal, or tax advice. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a final decision.